Hi folks, we're back with lecture number 16 on the Great War or World War I. Now you might wonder why World War I was referred to as the Great War. It's simply because the scale and scope of devastation that the participating countries will experience will be so much greater than they had ever experienced in prior conflicts. So great in this sense does not mean good, it means fearsomely bad. So we need to turn now to a discussion of the many different causes for the Great War or World War I. So we'll start with rampant imperialism during the 19th century. Now if you'll recall in a prior lecture, the 19th century was marked by a number of European powers as well as the United States and other powers reaching out to other areas of the world to take over other countries by force in a bid to secure new markets for their goods and to assist their militaries. In order to do this though, what we will see is that this imperialist race in places like Africa or the Pacific is going to spark a heated arms race among many of these colonizing nations. An arms race is simply, um, you know, who can build more guns, who can build bigger ships, who can create more deadlier weapons technology. For example, the standing armies of France and Germany doubled in size between 1870 and 1914. An extremely competitive naval race also followed among several nations, particularly between Germany and Great Britain. By 1889, the British had established the principle that in order to maintain their naval superiority in the event of war, they would need a navy two and a half times as large as the second largest navy. The Germans, therefore, discovering this, commenced enlarging their own navy to keep pace. What this means is that when events start to go sideways during the summer of 1914, these powers are armed to the teeth. And many of them uh, feel like that it's time for them to show off to the rest of the world all the money that they've recently sunk into their latest weapons technology. They're spoiling for a fight, in other words. Another major factor behind why this war will break out in 1914 is competing alliance systems. You have powers that, in a bid to secure collective security, will enter into defensive alliances with other powers. So for instance, we will see that in uh, the 1880s, we will see what becomes known as the Triple Alliance formed between several powers such as Italy, Austria-Hungary, and Germany. And the thinking on the part of these countries is that, okay, uh, Italy, if someone attacks you, then Austria, Hungary, and Germany will, will scramble in your defense. And then vice versa, if someone attacks us, we expect you to have our back. Well, as word of this alliance system leaked out, we have other nations that are going to say, well, if you can do it, then we can do it too. Uh, and we'll have the so-called Triple Entente formed by 1907, and that's going to include Imperial Russia, France, and the United Kingdom. The net result of these competing alliance systems means that both sides are sort of locked and loaded, right? They've been building up their weapons arsenals, their navies for a number of years. Now they know that if they end up mixing it up with another foreign power that they've got someone who will help them out. This means that by the summer of 1914, uh, no one is willing to back down on either side. No one's willing to let cooler heads prevail and simply talk their way out of the situation that will develop that summer. They're just simply ready to go at it. The potent force of nationalism is also behind uh, many of these countries' bluster. Uh, they are going to develop powerful nationalist movements where people will say, well, of course Russia is superior to any other country. Of course France is better than any other country. Well, these types of attitudes, again, do not work in favor of diplomacy during the summer of 1914. They don't help to diffuse tensions. They make um, both sides tend to be a little more aggressive as they kind of want to showcase what they feel like is the superiority of their cultures. Also, there's nationalism at work in southeastern Europe. 
uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had been sort of oozing southward for a number of years, seeking to increase their territory in regions such as Serbia and Romania and Bulgaria. Well, for the peoples that live there, for the Serbs that live there, they don't want to be under foreign control. Russia also takes a keen interest in the fate of their Slavic brethren. Russia also sees that it wants some control in southeastern Europe during these uh, in these uh, regions, and so there's been a lot of tension building lately between Russia and Austria-Hungary over the fate of these Slavic peoples there. Uh, there's the notion of pan-Slavism, that all Slavic people should be united under one umbrella, and this is what Russia is championing. However, Austria-Hungary says, nope, that's not what we're interested in. We just simply want to take over this region, and we're not going to allow these people to have their independence. The breaking point for all of this came on June 28, 1914, when the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated in Sarajevo, Bosnia by a Serbian nationalist. Remember I said in the prior slide that you've got uh, a lot of pan-Slavic sentiment in these regions. The Serbians do not want to be under Austro-Hungarian control. So one of the independence movements decided let's kill their future king and send a clear message. We will not be taken over. Immediately following the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the Austrian ambassador to Berlin found that the Germans, especially Kaiser Wilhelm, supported a war to punish this Serbian independence movement. In other words, they were ready to, ready to ride. Germany essentially offered Austria-Hungary what became known as a blank check. A blank check. In other words, dude, do what you got to do. We, we got you. you know, we, we will support you no matter what you want to do. So the Serbians are not going to back down. They are convinced that they have struck a blow for their independence and they're not going to back down. Uh, Austria's annexation of the neighboring state of Bosnia in 1908 uh, just sent them into a fury. So uh, the Serbians also had uh, promises from Russia to help them out. And so now the Serbians are saying, hey, Russia, remember you said you would help us out? Well, Austria-Hungary is now deciding to invade us. Can you help a neighbor out? Russia agreed because, again, it's not just about pan-Slavism. They want that territory for themselves, right, in southeastern Europe. But Russia agreed, and this is what sets uh, the dominoes to falling. Now, for their part, Germany, as I said, is ready to throw down. They, they have been for a while. But notice that Germany is sandwiched right in between two of the triple entente powers in other words along their eastern front there's russia which they're about to go to war with and then on their western front there uh there's france that's allied with russia so germany on the eve of everything about to go down go, to go down during the summer of 1914 they realize that if russia declares war france will quickly declare war too they don't want to fight on two fronts simultaneously. That means they'd have to split their militaries and some of them to the east to fight the Russians, some of them to the west to fight the French. They think of these two powers, which one, if we throw everything at them very, very quickly, which one of these two powers could we defeat the easiest? They will decide that France is where they need to begin their assault. They will implement what becomes known as the Schlieffen Plan. But in order to quickly and overwhelmingly strike in France, Germany needed to march their troops through Belgium, another neighbor of theirs. And Belgium was not involved in all of these shenanigans taking place during the summer of 1914. They were neutral. They will ask the Belgians, hey, neighbor, would you mind if we marched, you know, several hundred thousand of our troops through your backyard? We'll clean up when we're done, right? And all that. Belgium said no. Germany did it anyway. And so when Germany began mobilizing against France, implementing their Schlieffen plan, uh, that is what will bring Britain in as well. Because look, just right across the English Channel from Belgium is Britain. Now, Britain would have joined the war anyway because they were part of the Triple Entente powers. But this just speeds up this process. So so now we have all-out war between the Triple Alliance powers on the one hand. They became known as the Central Powers in this war. And then the Triple Entente Powers, which become known as the Allied Powers. Now in order to understand why this war became so deadly so fast, 
uh, it's useful for us to take a look at the way things had been fought prior to this conflict. You would line up your soldiers in nice, neat formations, and you would approach an enemy, usually over an open battlefield during daylight hours, and you would duke it out that way. These battle tactics, though, are not going to work with the introduction of newer, much deadlier weapons technology in World War I. So, for example, with the introduction of machine guns, if you approach your enemy on a battlefield and you have a machine gun and they're all lined up in these nice, neat rows, you're just going to mow them down. But again, they have the same technology. So they're going to mow you down. So this is uh, how the war begins with these old school battle tactics. That's not how it will be continued to be fought. Other newer, deadlier weapons technology introduced during the Great War will include chlorine and phosgene gases, mustard gas, the introduction of armored vehicles or tanks, high-powered long-distance rifles. Some of the first grenades will be deployed in this conflict. So as you can tell, these are major game changers, and this is why the death toll is going to start creeping up very, very quickly in this conflict. So how do you escape the hail of bullets coming over your head? You dig into the ground itself and use that as a fortress. When we talk about the Great War, we often discuss the introduction of so-called trench warfare. And this very quickly devolves into a, a static way of fighting. Once you have some safety behind these earthenworks, to launch an, an overland attack against your enemy is going to result in a very high casualty rate. But trench, staying in the trenches wasn't always safe either. What we will see is disease will spread very quickly in the close living quarters of people in these trenches on both sides. Or um, chlorine gas containers that were launched from the enemy side, they can quickly billow through these enclosed spaces and kill people before they could get their gas mask on. Soldiers on both sides were exposed to snow or rain in the winter, hypothermia, sunstroke in the summertime. Rats scurried about the trenches carrying fleas and lice, other vectors for disease. And what we're going to see is a very high casualty rate due to trench warfare in exchange for very little uh, actual movement of troops. For instance, in the Battle of the Somme in the summer of 1916, the British and French gained a measly 125 miles of territory from the Germans, but it cost them 600,000 dead or wounded soldiers. The Germans lost 500,000, and this is just one campaign on the continent. There was a similarly grim mortality rate on the Eastern Front where Russian troops were always playing catch up during the war. For instance, as early as 1915, just one year into this conflict, Russia had already suffered over two million casualties and had lost Kurland, Lithuania, and much of Belarus to the Central Powers. Now fast forward several more years, and after three years of stalemate on the Eastern Front, Russia is seriously starting to falter. Their supplies of shells and ammunition were running low by this point. Untrained Russian soldiers were being sent to the front without rifles and told to simply find guns among their dead comrades. Also, poor leadership weakened the country of Russia at home under Tsar Nicholas II. He had complete control over the army and government and very much disliked the middle classes in the lower house of parliament. Making matters worse at home, agricultural production began to slump. Civilians had to endure serious food shortages as food prices began jumping to six times their normal price. Labor union strikes began to drag on. Basically, you're starting to see anti-war sentiment building in Russia by 1917. We will see as early as March of that year a revolution against the Tsar, who they feel like has mismanaged Russia's uh, wartime effort. And not only that, but workers' councils began seeking real reform. By the summer, peasants were simply seizing land from landowners. Later that year, we'll see the Bolshevik Revolution, the Communist Revolution, take place in Russia. And with so much domestic instability going on back home in Russia, and with the people tired of fighting the war anyway, one of the first things this new communist government will do is withdraw Russia from the war. They will sign a separate peace with Germany and simply agree to stop fighting. And we'll have more on the course of the war in the second half of this recorded video lecture.